Up next, Elizabeth Wig is a technical solutions engineer at Puppet Labs, and she's going to give a Puppet demo. This is a really good time if you have questions, if you have things you're wondering about Puppet that have been keeping you up late at night, crying, confused, excited. This is a good time to ask about those things. Uh, Elizabeth can answer those questions um, sort of throughout as well as afterwards. So, so kind of get that, get that ready and learn a little bit more in this Puppet demo. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Kara. Hey, everybody. I'm just bringing up my bigger boxes so give me a second. How's it going? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I needed that. OK, here we go. So um, because it sounds like there's a lot of people that weren't here last year and there's a lot of beginners, I'm going to go through just a really basic uh, puppet demo. If you were at uh, Puppet Camp Seattle last year, it's probably going to be like maybe annoyingly familiar. So if you want to get on your computer, I won't be offended. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to kind of figure out what's going on. Does that look good, everybody? It's a little odd. I think they're probably still um, like wide set up for widescreen. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Is that okay? <coughs> The other way was better. Oh well, no! At least this way you can the screen. At least this way I won't be showing things that you that I can see and you guys can't. Okay, awesome. So as Kara mentioned, I'm the solutions engineer for the Pacific Northwest region. So um, Joe and I travel around and do demos and talk to people about Puppet and do proof concepts and things like that. So what I want to do is just go over like some, some really high level basics. I'm going to talk about the Puppet language and the constructs of the Puppet language itself, sort of how we think about configuration management and how you can define the state you want your servers to be in. Uh, then we're going to go through and create a manifest, just a, a really small you know, file that, that describes the state we would want a, a user to be in. And then we're going to go through uh, the console. So, if you have questions during the demo, please stop me. Monologues are the worst. So you raise your hand or just yell at me if, if you have a question and I can probably answer it. Or if I can't, Eric certainly can. Right? Good setup, huh? OK. So at just at a really high level, you know, Puppet itself is just a, a language. It's the, the language that you're describing the state you want your servers to be in. So you're saying, you know, I want my users to exist. This is the user that I want to exist. I need my services to be up and running. These packages installed at this particular version. And it allows you to have this normalized language that you use to describe the state across, you know, a, a wide, uh, number of servers. So whether it's Windows servers or Linux servers, um, you don't have to worry about sort of the, the how of, of, you know, where do I need to go on my Windows server to create this user versus where I go on my Linux server. You have a normalized way of, of saying, just make sure this user exists with these attributes and Puppet will figure out the underlying piece for you. So there's a couple of terms I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is resources. I'm sure you've heard um, you know, mo all the speakers today talking about Puppet resources, and it's kind of the most uh, uh, granular piece of the way that Puppet thinks about your infrastructure. So, um, you know, a user is a resource, a service, a file, a package, and there's all of these built-in resource types that come uh, sort of out of the box with Puppet that you can use to pass, uh, you know, attributes to and, and define the state you want those resources to be in. So, you know, here I am, I'm on a, a CentOS server, I'm actually on my Puppet Master right now. And what I can do is I can type in, you know, Puppet Resource User, and this is going to interrogate my system and bring back a list of all of the users that exist on the server and the current configuration of those users in Puppet code. So this is actually showing you, um, you know, a, a little snippet of what, what the current configuration is and kind of giving you a little bit of a jump start on, okay, I need to actually configure my servers 
and a configuring my users. This is, this is kind of the building blocks of, of what I would need to, to do. These are some of the attributes that I can pass to this resource type. I can do the same thing on a Windows server. So here I am on a, a Windows Server 2008 box. Is that, uh, I'm gonna make the font a little bit bigger. Is that better? So I can type in the same thing, puppet resource user, and it's going to again interrogate the system and show me all of the users that currently exist on this system in Puppet's domain specific language or DSL. So you can see that some of the attributes are different on Windows than they would be on Linux. You know, like the concept of a shell doesn't really exist on Windows, but the, the premise is the same, sort of the language that you're using is the same to, to call out and define each of these resource types. I can do the same thing with uh, services, so Puppet Resource Service. It's going to interrogate and show me all of the services that are on the system, whether they're running, whether they're stopped, whether they're enabled to start at boot time or not. Uh, but really the point here is you, know, you, you don't have to remember you know, exactly how to do this on each of your systems. You're just telling Puppet, hey, this is what I want this to look like, and Puppet's taking care of it in the background. Question? Yeah. Is there a, like a pretty fine version of that in production management form? I'm sorry? Is there a pretty fine option to put that in tabular form? In tabular form. So, you know, like a synopsis. One line for service name. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you could put that out into a like a I mean, yeah, an XML file or something. Sure. There's no right. Now that that the cool thing about that output is it's actually like the same. You could you would probably do this in a second, but you can pipe it back into the puppet. So like you can take that output and write it into a manifest file directly. Right, which so is what we're gonna do. Right, right. So the question was, can you make this look prettier and, and dump it into a, a file somewhere or, or you know, separate them out by each individual resource? And the answer is um, kind of. You can, you can you know, pipe it into a file and then manage that file. But uh, basically, we're giving you sort of a starting point for here's the services that exist, and here's what you need to define on these individual services. Now, there's a number of these different resource types. So Puppet, um, you know, when it ships, comes with all these different resource types uh, kind of out of the box. So, you know, you can have a scheduled task if you're on Windows, uh, cron jobs if you're on Linux. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of different resource types uh, that exist just when you install Puppet right off the bat. But you can extend these resource types as well. So, um, you know, if there's tasks that you're doing over and over again, um, for example, the uh, being able to manage registry keys. Someone wrote a, a new uh, resource type and added it to the forge, and now you can download that and you've, you've essentially added to this list of available resource types to be able to say, you know, here's the resource, the, the registry key that I need. Um, you know, this is these are the rules that I wanted to have or what have you. Makes sense. Okay, great. So let's see. Uh, so as um, Eric mentioned, actually, I'm going to wait to create a manifest and talk about the forge. So, um, you know, a, a bunch of people have mentioned the forge already today, and I, I just want to make sure that everybody is sort of clear on, you know, what the forge is and 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 what it does and how you can use it and interact with it. So, the Puppet Forge is our online repository of. Uh, of modules that we either at Puppet Labs have written and shared out uh, as well as uh, Puppet community members so people using um, you know Puppet out in the wild that have kind of gone through the work of, of puppetizing a piece of their infrastructure and they want to share it out so that other people can use it too. Uh, we have a number of different designations for this so we have the, the Puppet supported modules those are written in-house uh, at Puppet Labs uh, we run tests against them, and if you're a Puppet Enterprise customer and you have an issue, you can write in. It's supported. It's a pretty common sense term. Um, Puppet approved modules. So, you know, in the past, we've had you know a ton of these modules available, and people would go on the forge and say, you know, there's 
2,500 modules up there, but how do I know which, which of these are any good? Someone, someone could have just published it and said, you know, I, I want people to, to write pull requests against this and, and fix it, but it's not very good to start with. So what we've done is we're trying to use what people have already done and sort of put our, our, our stamp of approval on it to say, you know, we would recommend that you use this. We've taken a look and kind of follow some best practices. We also have automated tests that are running against all of the modules on the board, so you can, you know, open one of them up and see, uh, you know, what is the, the quality score, so that's doing things like checking for syntax errors and things like that uh, of the module itself, as well as a community rating, so based on how people answer, you know, a certain list of, of questions, how is the community rating of how useful or helpful this module is or how easy it is to use. So let's take a look. There's a couple of, of modules that I want to point out. And so, so the, term, the term module itself is really just describing, it's like a, a, a directory system that contains everything you would need for that, uh, for that puppet code to work on your system. So you know, if, if you uh, call out, I, you know, I want to use this particular NTP class, it knows where to go within that file system to find that class and be able to describe, you know, what state you want that class to be in and things like that. And, and classify your nodes with those classes. Sorry, I feel like that was a useless sentence, so <laughs> you can just forget that I said that. Um, so let's take a look at some of uh, the supported modules. So for the most part, uh, all of these modules on the Forge are, are free to use by anyone. You can download them and use them on your systems. Uh, we have two right now that are only available to Puppet Enterprise customers. That is the SQL, Microsoft SQL Server module um, and the F5 module for managing F5 load balancers. So let's take a look at the SQL Server module. So to, to get this module on your system, all you would need to do is you know, copy this string and uh, paste it you know, onto uh, any, any of your servers that are running puppets. You can download the module itself, and then it gives you some instructions. Most of these, you know, especially the approved and supported modules, have uh, sort of examples of how to use this code uh, on your system. So we have you know, the SQL Server module here, it's describing, you know, how are, how are you gonna actually install SQL Server? Where are you getting this from? Is it mounted on, is, is there a mounted ISO on the system? Uh, is it in a file share somewhere? Um, and then you can, you know, create databases, uh, create logins within SQL Server itself. Um, you can load in a dump of an existing SQL Server database onto a system. Um, but again, being able to have this, uh, you know, code that you've written that you can check in somewhere and then someone can actually go and look at this as sort of executable documentation to see, you know, what exists on the system, how is it configured, what are the parameters uh, that we're using to, to sort of configure uh, SQL Server, for instance, on my system. Can you use public resource against SQL Server the state of current So it depends. So, so the, the question was, can you use you know, Puppet Resource uh, Instant SQL Server to find out the current uh, state of the instances of SQL Server on your system? Um, it depends on whether, on, on the type of module it is. So if the module itself is creating a, a custom resource type or a new resource type, then you, then you certainly could. However, in some cases, uh, the modules themselves could be uh, a new provider or a new backend. So the PowerShell module, for example, is a, is a provider module. It's saying, um, I'm going to let you point to and say, you know, run this using PowerShell on the system. So it, it really depends on the type of module. I'm not sure, Eric, have you dug into the SQL Server module? I'm not talking about that one specifically. Okay. I can get back to you on that. Um, let's see, we have the NTP module. You know, this is, this is a good place to start. Most everyone across all platforms has to manage NTP on their servers. It's a, it's a really good starting point uh, to be able to, you know, call out, you know, which servers you want to point to as your NTP servers and you can make, you know, sort of dynamic decisions if this is a, 
a, a Windows server, then point to these NTP boxes. If, if this uh, lives in this particular domain, point to these other uh, NTP servers for, uh, you know, uh, on those particular uh, puppet agents. All right. Let's see. So let's go back over. So, so far, you know, I, I've mostly talked about um, how to interrogate your system, see what already exists on that system um, in, in Puppet code, but for the most part, you're going to want to actually have Puppet do something on each of your agents. Uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've mentioned agent and master. All of the servers that you want to manage with Puppet, you put an agent on those servers, the agent checks in with the master, and, uh, you know, receives instructions on how to configure that server based on the Puppet code that you've applied to it. So here I am, I'm on my Puppet Master, and, and let's use that resource, uh, that user resource example I was talking about earlier. So if I say Puppet Resource User um, Root, I can get the specifics of a particular user on the, the, the root user on the system. And let's say I've decided that uh, I want to manage something about the root user. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump this into a file, I'll just call it root.pp. Anything with that .pp file extension is what we call a Puppet Manifest, and it really just means it's a text file that contains Puppet code. So I'm going to open up that uh, Puppet Manifest, and again, here is the standard, uh, you know, resource declaration saying, you know, this is the, the resource type is user, the name is root, and, and a list of attributes. So at this point, I can say, uh, you know, which, which attributes do I want to actually manage? Maybe I want to change the comment to be managed by a puppet. Uh, I might not care about the password min or max age. Uh, maybe I don't care about the UID for some reason. And I want the shell to be, uh, you know, bin sh instead of bin bash. So at this point, all I have done is said, this is, this is the state that I want my root user to be in, but I, have, I haven't actually applied it to the system yet. So the root user is currently still has that old comment and the old uh, shell uh, configuration. So what I can do is I can say, I can apply that particular manifest on my system but maybe I, I don't want to go ahead and actually have it enforce it right away. I want, to, I want to do a check to make sure that Puppet is going to do what I want it to do on that system. I'm not ready for it to just go out and make the change. I can add what we call this no operation uh, or simulation flag onto, uh, onto this run to say, just tell me what Puppet would do to get me to this state. I don't want you to go ahead and actually make the change yet. Just tell me which, which attributes it would change to get me to this state. So what it's done here is it's come back and showed me, okay, we've noticed that there's a difference between the desired state you put within your manifest and the current state of the root user on your system. So right now, the current value of the comment is root. It should be managed by Puppet, but it's adding this little no-op designation at the end to say, we haven't actually gone ahead and made this change. We're just letting you know that Puppet would do this if you applied this to your system. So now that I've seen that Puppet is in fact going to do what I wanted it to do, I can remove that no-op designation and uh, just apply that change on my system. So now if I type in Puppet resource user root again, I can see that it's changed the comment to be managed by Puppet and the shell to be uh, a bin sh. So this, this whole process that I went through um, on this CentOS box would be the same process I go through on my Windows box. Um, you know, so again, just reiterating the being able to have this normalized language that you're using across your system. So it yeah. uses the, the name of their root on the first line uh, as the sort of the, the unique key, right? No, the next line down. This one? Yeah, that's the, that's the unique key. So you could, you know, obviously, okay, so two questions now. Mm -hmm. if, you were to, if you were to have a Second uh, resource that same name. Uh huh. Would it just apply the first one, and then it just apply the second one? No, that's a great question. So the question was, if you were going to have a second resource by the same name, like if I tried to have two separate 
um, you know, root user resources. And I said, you know, one of them I want the shell to be bin bash and one I want to be bin sh. Then uh, the, the run wouldn't be successful. The, what we call the catalog wouldn't compile because you're trying to have a duplicate resource declaration and, you know. But if you had, let's just say you could spell root. Mm -hmm. And, but, but you have the same GID. Wait, what, what? It would, cr it would create that, that, that misspelled user. Yeah, but I mean, even though it shared the same, uh, well, what else would be, um, would there be a conflict with, I guess, nothing more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could. Yeah, so it's only if, if you're trying to, to, to manage the same resource you know, in, in two different places. And that happens a lot, especially if you have multiple people writing puppet code in different places. Uh, okay, so the question is though, I, 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 maybe I'm, I'm not understand, understanding this correctly. Um, a, a user ID, for instance, I, I, as I understand, you can't have two users with the same user ID. You are, so if you were to spell that, have the same user ID as zero. You, you, I mean, you technically can have more than one user with the same user okay. ID. Yep. I'm sorry? For clients. For clients? That's a great that's a great follow up to my next piece. So so what I've done so far is just just for the sake of, of clarity, I've I've made the sort of the simplest manifest possible that I've applied locally onto my system. I haven't uh, I, I haven't wrapped it in a way that I could say I want the root user to exist with these attributes on a hundred of my servers. So let's look at how how you would do that. Let's um, I'm going to look at. Um, I'm going to look at a, a manifest that already exists. Uh, okay, so in this in this case, we're you know managing uh, you know uh, open SSH on a system. In this case, there are actually three different resource types within uh, this particular manifest. So instead of the user resource type, we have a file, uh, a package, and a service. Um, and we're wrapping them all together into what we call a puppet class. Now the classes is what you call out to say, I want you know, all of my Red Hat servers to receive this OpenSSH Red Hat class, and it will apply on each of those systems these uh, you know, resource declarations to, to give those, those systems you know, make sure that the OpenSSH package is installed. It's kind of doing exactly what we did on, on the master with that root example, but across, you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 servers. All the servers that I've given this, this uh, I've classified with the OpenSSH Red Hat class. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's more like a no-op part. So if we're using Git, right? Mm -hmm. We're sending all this stuff up to source control. And you want to go test something on the client and say, mm -hmm. hey, I got this, got this power on my field, let's see what happens. Now, send it up to Git, go to the source stuff, and then suck it down like you want to do it in a way of testing a single PP file that was written on a different server against a client that's somewhere out in the field. Ways away from that. Yeah, so, so you could do it a couple different ways. You could classify that server with you know, this OpenSSH Red Hat class, for example, and then go and run Puppet, either, you know, shell into that particular server itself or um, remotely from the master, kick off a, an ad hoc Puppet run and add that dash dash no op designation, and you'll get a report back that says, these are all of the resources that I would have changed on the system, or if it's already in that state, it, it would stay exactly the same. Well, what would you UNC class as a target? Will it take UNC paths yeah, as a target? So what I want to do is apply whack whack at UDN to server dot pp dash no op. Which is not a good. FQDN dash dash. Yeah, so like, so like no. slash start to do it with Windows real, right? Where you up and fly, the, instead of using the local file, right? You do slash slash to the total file server. I mean, you could copy the file itself onto that system, 
and then run it that way. So either SCP or sometimes Or you can you, you can make a class out of that out of that manifest and apply it to that system and then run it in NOAA from the master. Okay. Cool. Good questions. Okay, but um, so before I, I kind of exit out of here, I want to make sure that you know we kind of walk through this. So you know you can see it's it's really it's really readable to be able to say okay I can see what we're trying to do here we're making sure that the open SSH server package is installed then we're going to manage the SSHD configuration file we're setting the owner and the and the group and the mode and then we're actually pointing to the source of the file so in this case we kind of have a blessed copy of that SSHD configuration file that lives within the module itself so we're doing like an MD5 checksum against you know the, the SSHD configuration file on the agent if it exists and the one on the master. And if anything changes, if you need to make a change to that configuration file, you just have to do it in one place on the master. And then when the agent wakes up and checks in, it's going to see, hey, I, I don't have the correct version of this SSHD configuration file anymore. I'm going to serve down this one that exists on the master so that you don't have to go out to each and every single server and, and make that change manually. And then finally, we're saying, I want to make sure that that SSHD service is up and running, that it's enabled at boot time, and then that subscribe metaparameter is actually watching uh, that SSHD config file on the agent. And if it does get a new version, if, that, if, if we do make a change and it sends down a new version of that file, we're telling it to refresh that service so that it picks up on those changes so that you're not you know, I, I've definitely done that when I was uh, managing servers where I would change a file and didn't refresh the service and it sucked. So there's nothing in this manifest that says do this on a Red Hat only system, so I assume you're just assigning this class to only Red Hat servers. Right, so yeah, you guys are awesome. This is like the next level is how do you actually decide and, and call out which of my servers should receive all of this, you know, each, each of my pieces of puppet code. So, you know, on my master, I could have, you know, I have this, this uh, uh, Red Hat class that exists on my master. I have, um, you know, I could have like a, a Solaris class, Windows classes, but you need to decide which pieces of your puppet code should live on which systems. And that's where, where classification comes into play, is what we call it, because it's deciding which server should receive which classes. So um, we can do that from the Puppet Enterprise console itself to call out you know, which, which classes should, should go on which servers and, and write some rules around that. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But before I forget to do that, before I do that, I don't want to forget to show you guys one other piece that, that's pretty important and is, is one of the things that kind of differentiates uh, Puppet from, uh, you know, writing scripts. So right now, the, the desired state that I put within that manifest already exists on the system. I've applied it to the system. The root user comment and shell are exactly what I want them to be. So I can keep applying this Puppet code. Oops. Oh, I moved. I can keep applying this puppet code to the system, and since it already matches the state the server is in, it's not gonna do anything. It just leaves everything alone. So you, you can safely have the puppet agent waking up every 30 minutes and checking into the master and, and enforcing this, this desired state, and if it's already in that spot, it, it, you, you'll get a report back that says, hey, uh, you know, all of these resources were already in the state we, we, you wanted them to be in, so we didn't need to do anything to, to get you there. That makes sense. All right, so let's switch over and take a look at the console. All right, so within the Puppet Enterprise console itself, here on this first page, I can see I have a list of servers. Um, these are all of the servers, you know, uh, on you know my particular in my vagrant environment that I have a Puppet agent installed on them. So you can see that I have a couple of, of Windows servers, uh, Ubuntu boxes. I could have a Solaris server in here, CentOS, Red Hat. All of these are kind of tied into the single um, management console, so you can see what's happening with all of them uh, from one place. 
these uh, color-coded check marks over on the left-hand side, excuse me, tell me what happened the last time the Puppet agent ran on those systems. So if I'm seeing green showing up here, that's telling me that Puppet ran on the systems, Those they, they matched the desired state I wanted, all of the services that I wanted to be running were running, the users existed the way I needed them to be, um, and so Puppet didn't have to do anything to get me to that desired end state. Blue is going to tell me that Puppet had to do something on the system to, to get it there. So maybe I've added a new classification to that system. Maybe I just recently added that OpenSSH server, uh, uh, OpenSSH Red Hat class, and it needed to you know download, uh, you know install the package, pull down that that SSH config file, and start the service. Uh, it's just letting you know that Puppet did something in the last run um, to get you to that desired state. And then you'll see failures showing up here as well as uh, you know, the, the, that no operation designation as well. So if you ran Puppet on a server and uh, passed in that dash dash no op flag, if it noticed that it would have done something to get you to that desired end state, you'll see sort of an orange uh, circle or splat showing up uh, next to the, the name of the server to say, hey, there is a difference, but we didn't actually go ahead and enforce it. You might want to check it out and decide if that's what you want Puppet to do on the system. I promise I'm getting to your classification question. Just building suspense. All right, so here I am. I'm on, I, I've selected one of my servers. Um, this is giving me some information about uh, you know, some daily run stats so I can get a sense of how long is it taking the Puppet agent to run on my systems over the last you know, 30 days. Uh, we'll dig into some reports here in a couple of minutes. But uh, I really want to call out this inventory information. So I mentioned before that you can say, OK, if I'm running on a Windows system, apply you know, this code, if I'm running on a Linux system or a Red Hat system, apply this different code. And the way that we're identifying uh, those attributes of your machines is with a tool called Factor. So um, Factor runs, every time the Puppet Agent runs, the first thing it does is collects these Factor facts. And it sends these Factor facts to the master. And the master kind of identifies the node based on those facts. So you can see we have um, you know, some information here, like what's the name of the, the OpenSSL cert for this particular agent? Uh, what data center does it live in, or what domain is it a part of? You can get information on the IP address, uh, available memory, um, the FQDN, there's a ton of information you can get uh, just out of the box with Factor, and these Factor facts are super easy to extend and customize. So, if you know you want to find out, you know what's the geographic location of a particular server, you can, uh, you know, add that in here. You could drop like a just a plain text file onto a server to create your own custom external fact if you wanted to. Um, basically, any file that has you know a key value pair within it or a script that can output you know a single value is something you could uh, create a custom fact out of. So this is a really extensible piece um, of of the puppet suite, if you will. All right, so let's talk about classification. Oh, man. All right, so here's how we're actually deciding uh, which of my nodes or, or agents should receive which pieces of puppet code. So um, I have these different node groups and the node groups themselves are, are doing a couple of things. So if I look at my Linux servers node group, for example, here I can see on this first page we're creating rules around which agents or servers should automatically be, be put into this group, which, which servers uh, should be a part of the Linux servers node group, and we're doing that based on those factor facts that we just looked at. So we're saying, you know, if the kernel is Linux, go ahead and add that server into this Linux servers group, um, and exclude uh, the, the, master, uh, uh, the master server because we don't want that to be a part of this Linux servers group um, you know, for whatever reason we've decided. So you can, you can pull from any of those factor facts. You can write regexes. Um, you can say you know, uh, if it's in this domain or this data center, uh, you know, if it's serving this particular business group, then you know, apply the classes that, that exist within uh, within this node group. 
I can look over my matching nodes and I can see based on those rules, one of these nodes got pulled in to this bucket. Um, and, Kate, and if any of you are like doing some math on the number of servers that were on the front page, I only brought up a couple of vagrant boxes, so that's why it's only showing up as one. <laughs> Keeping it honest. Um, and then here's where you call out those classes. So here I can say, okay, I want the NTP class to be assigned to this particular server. I can pass in parameters if I wanted to. Um, I could add in the OpenSSH Red Hat class. All of these classes that are showing up here are, uh, are, are just you know, puppet code that lives on the master itself. So you're just calling out those classes that exist within those, those manifests on your system. Yep. Is there any significance to the uh, either term on, on either side of the winner, the double goal, and the winner? Yeah, so the, the question was, is, is there a significance to the terms on uh, you know, each side of the double colons? And this is how Puppet knows where to go to find that particular class. So um, on like the OpenSSH uh, Red Hat class, for example, will live within the OpenSSH module under the manifest directory in a file called Red Hat. So it's a, it's a scoping thing about how, how Puppet can find all of, all of these different classes and the files that you might be calling out within those classes. Um, and that sort of structure and bundling those together is what we call the modules. Is it only two levels? Or do you have no, you can go as deep as you want. Yeah? So if you're already using the rules of profiles, should they just turn this off, or is it a good use case yeah, so the question was, if you're using roles and profiles, should you turn this off or uh, use this in conjunction with roles and profiles? And um, it's kind of up to you. You can certainly have Linux, you know, you, you could just have a single role applied to each of these node groups so that if someone needs to get visibility into, you know, what are the matching nodes that would be in the Linux servers group or in my, you know, development environment or something like that, uh, you would just add that single role uh, class instead of you know multiple classes, or you have the option you know if you're doing it in site.pp or in higher or something, you can kind of keep it there if you want to. So, really quickly, roles and profiles is sort of this um, convention that you can use to get down to a point where you just have a single class that you would have to apply to a system. So, um, I, I'm going to try to not talk about this too much might be confusing. I can point you to some blog posts that are really helpful. If you go to GaryLarissa.com, uh, he has a really great write-up of uh, the, the roles and profiles paradigm and why you should use them and how to think about it. So I think I'm actually just going to leave it there because I don't want to be confusing. Is that okay? We can talk about it after if anybody's interested. Okay, and uh, also within this uh, you know, with these different node groups, I have the ability to look and see, all right, what is the activity that's been happening on this node group? You know, uh, who has added any classes to it? Um, has anyone, you know, added any or, or changed any of the rules that decide which server should be added into these particular classes? Uh, or excuse me, into this particular node group. So you kind of have a, a, a running audit log of, of what's happening and, and who's making changes for better or for worse, depending on who you are if you made a mistake. It's like a git blame in the public console, basically. All right, let's see. Um, let's take a look at access control. Are you guys so bored? You look so bored. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know how I can try to spice it up. Um, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't have any good RBAC jokes. I don't know if anybody else does. All right, we're gonna get a drink soon. Um, okay, but this is all really important and that's why I'm talking about it, so bear with me. Um, so within the access control piece, this is where you can call out you know, different user roles and, and how you want people to be able to interact with the console itself. So you can integrate this with LDAP or Active Directory to pull in, uh, you know, Active Directory groups and say, you know, um, the the QA team 
should have the ability to change the rules on you know this particular node group uh, to decide which server should be added in there, but they can't change the classification um, or vice versa. So so really getting pretty granular about uh, you know how you want these people how you, how you want different groups of users to be able to interact and make changes uh, within the console itself, so that people aren't going in and you know, maybe they're not as familiar with the code, uh, or maybe they are, you know, don't have the, shouldn't have the authority to add servers in and out of a particular group, you can uh, limit their access here. And, and this has the same, uh, I believe, the same audit log as well that you can look at. Okay. So, Let's look at some reports. So as I mentioned, you know, when you, when you run a Puppet on a system, it collects those factor facts and sends them back to the master. The master then looks at the classification, uh, you know, whether you're doing it with roles and profiles and, and hierarchy site WP or within the console itself, and decides based on those factor facts which pieces of Puppet code should be applied to the system. The master then compiles what we call a catalog, and it's just a list of resource declarations, like that one that we saw, you know, like the, the, the root user resource declaration that says these are the states that all of these different resources should be in on this system. It goes and compares the current state of that system to what is specified within the catalog and says either, you know, everything's already in the right, uh, the right configuration or, you know, maybe it needs to change a couple of things, start a couple services. Uh, you know, whatever it needs to do to sort of get you to that point. And then the agent itself sends a report back to say this is what happened during that run. So let's take a look at one of those reports. So there's a couple different views I can look at here. Um, this first view just gives me some metrics, uh, letting me know how many resources were actually changed during that run. I can scroll down and sort of see which different categories it falls into. You know, did, did we try to, to apply any resources and weren't successful? Uh, you know, maybe you tried to pull or, or enforce a particular file, but the file didn't exist on the master where, where you said it would, or tried to install a package that didn't exist in the repo that you were pointing to. Uh, we'll see an error showing up, uh, letting us know that those resources were not able to be applied successfully on the system. Um, and down here, this, this is, really helpful if you guys are ever running, you know, have your puppet agent, agent runs going and you're noticing that they're taking longer and longer, you've made a change and something is taking a long time and you're trying to figure out like what happened, why is this taking so long. This is kind of breaking up the, the run into a, 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 a number of different sort of resource categories. You can see, you know, in this case, uh, uh, retrieving the configuration and you know grabbing the file, installing the package, all of these things took you know X amount of seconds to complete on the system, uh, so that you don't have to sort of guess you know what what is taking longer, what is taking up that time to be able to actually um, run that with that puppet agent run. Yeah. Uh, is that all post catalog? Is that all that data? Yeah, so this, this data is after the catalog was sent back down to the agent and applied to the system. And this is giving you a report back of uh, w what happened when that catalog was sent down. So were there resources that had to change or not? Um, and how long did it take to apply the catalog on the system? So since factor is pre-catalog, is there any way to get, sometimes factories can take a long time trying to narrow down which one it is. So, so factor is just pulling that that list of, of inventory facts. Is that sorry, were you guys? Were you talking? <laughs> you want to share something with the rest of the class? Um, uh, factor is just going to pull up that list of attributes and send it to the master. So it's not actually trying to make any any sort of changes. So we run a custom fact. Um, and come back to that, mm -hmm. like trying to figure out what's really the real studio that's going to be on the Right. Mind, XYZ, right, that makes sense. Our public, our public runs, although they say they take three seconds, they really take three minutes because they're not taxed, we're actually writing against the system. Okay, back. that makes so sense. That's one thing that we know is a point of is that if we write a lot more custom facts on the uh, public 
Yeah, we try to speed up the process and make it as quick as possible. Yeah. <coughs> that time, that's actually the time to the customer. We'll see the problems with that one. So, we be able to get into there. Into like which factor facts are taking a long time? Yeah, like how to, how to speed up our queries or how to, uh, yeah, I mean, it's purely that pre catalog operation. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If you guys can think of a way to, to make that faster, we have just recently refactored and, and rewritten factor to perform, uh, you know, to have increased performance and run more efficiently. Uh, but depending on where you're getting that factor fact from, I mean, if you if you try to gather that factor fact information like from the command line and it takes three minutes, I don't know if that would. Eric, do you have a? I was and, yeah, there are more profiling kind of options, but um, if it's super early, like you, you basically would want to run factor with debugging on, and that'll let that'll like just tell you how long it took to collect the facts. But that's not normally something that's collected as part of the puppet profiling run. Okay. Thanks. All right, um, so over here we're looking at, you know, the, the log portion of the report is just showing you exactly what you would see if you had run this from the command line. So if you may feel more comfortable seeing things in that fashion, you can see what that looks like here. Uh, but the events view is definitely sort of the, the most helpful and, and comprehensive view of, of what happened during that run. So this is breaking it down by individual resource. Uh, you know, what Puppet was doing uh, and whether it successfully made changes to those resources or whether those resources were already in the state you wanted them to be in. So here it's letting me know that there were two file resource change, uh, uh, file resources that were changed on my system. Uh, it's pointing out, you know, that, 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 the, that the contents were actually changed from uh, something to something else and you can actually call out and see uh, what the old version of that file looked like and what the new version of that file looked like. Um, and here we're actually pointing out where within your Puppet code you've asked Puppet to, to manage this particular resource. So if you're going through any sort of debugging, uh, this is really helpful to, to be able to go back and say, I know that it's within this particular manifest, um, you know, around this particular line number where we tried to manage, you know, uh, the root vimrc uh, file itself. And then here we're showing, you know, there were also a number of, of other resources on the system that we're still managing with Puppet, um, but we, we actually didn't need to do anything because they were already in the desired state. So it's letting you know that we still are checking in on all of those other things that you've specified within your classes, uh, but Puppet didn't need to do anything to them to get them there. I'm sorry? The numbers at the end of the unchanged files. Um, I'm, they're probably the, the MD5 checksum. I can go check. These? This is, this is calling out the line number within the manifest where, uh, where you've told Puppet to uh, enforce that resource or manage that particular resource. Right, so it's saying, um, you know, in Etsy Pubble Labs Puppet uh, and the init.pp uh, manifest within the Java module um, around line 90 is where we've told, is where we've specified this particular um, uh, anchor resource. Other questions? Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I think what I want to do is uh, talk about, so you know, we, we really just sort of scratched the surface and just trying to get some basic concepts out there and, and sort of see what sticks for you guys. Um, but you know, we want this to be you know, a tool that helps you get to where you, you need your servers to be. And in order to do that, you need to you know, learn about what's, what's happening and what's, what's available and all of the syntax and different resource types that are available. So, we have a ton of documentation on our website. Um, 
you can go to docs.puppetlabs.com, this type reference. I have this bookmarked and I have it up all the time when I'm going through and writing puppet code. Uh, you know, it's calling out all of the different attributes that you could have for each of these different resource types. Um, but in general, you can always go to docs.puppetlabs.com, maybe do a search for, you know, whatever sort of language construct you're trying to work with and, and get some information there. Uh, we have training that's available. We have, you know, virtual training courses that we just came out with uh, so that you can, you know, sit at a computer and, and have a, a live instructor teach you, you know, things like how to write your first module or, um, you know, getting started with Puppet on Windows, for example, or, uh, you know, how to manage your Puppet code and what does that look like. Uh, there's a, a ton of resources available, um, you know, if, if you take the time to sort of dig in and, and, and interact with them. I've done a 245, right? Not 230. I think Kara would have gotten mad at me, but 245, okay. Um, and then there's things, you know, beyond just managing the state of the servers themselves. Uh, we're also allowing you to, for example, we have a, an AWS module on the Forge that lets you spin up new EC2 instances and uh, manage load balancers within AWS as well. Uh, so here again, I can see, you know, it's, this is giving me information on how do I get started with this? What are sort of the prerequisites that I need to use this particular uh, module uh, to be able to manage, you know, my EC2 instances in the same way in that same normalized language that I am on my servers themselves. Um, uh, I mentioned the F5 module, so being able to manage, uh, you know, an F5 load balancer with uh, the Puppet language itself. Um, and then we also have a tool called uh, Razor for bare metal provisioning. So if you have a new, uh, you know, bare metal server that comes online, uh, to be able to specify based on attributes of that server, maybe, you know, this, this, uh, this machine has this, you know, two processors and 16 gigs of memory and this MAC address. Uh, based on those attributes, I want to point to the, you know, Windows Server 2008 ISO or something like that to install that particular operating system, get an agent on it right away as soon as that uh, operating system is installed so you can kind of get, get off and running uh, right away with, with having Puppet managing that system. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh huh. Does, does it uh, like have an API to talk to the VMware to actually go configure uh, config uh, a virtual server? So yeah. So so right now we're actually working on a. Uh, uh, VMware a module similar to the AWS module to be able to do that. I'm sorry? To be able to spin up instances in VMware as well. VMware virtual machines. You can let the product people talk about that. I don't know what might would feel safer in the product. Uh-huh. How would we handle Mm -hmm. So the question was, how, how do you handle multi-node configuration? So like if I need DNS configured on one machine first and then, uh, you know, once that's done, do it on another machine. Uh, at this point, it's going to wait, you know, the Puppet agent is going to keep running and trying to enforce it until that configuration is ready on the other server, it's going to fail until it runs successfully. Right. There's something coming soon. There is there is a resource. Uh-huh. Right, right. Yeah, so there, um, Andy said that there is a, a wait resource you can use. I haven't actually played around with that, so if you have more questions, you can probably ask these guys. Uh, but M Collective is a, a, it's a tool that's bundled with Puppet Enterprise. It's in, uh, works using an active MQ message bus, so you can send out signals to sort of have an ad hoc puppet run happen on your systems, not just waiting that 30 minute interval. 
So you could technically say, go and kick off this puppet run on this server to configure DNS before, and then once that's done, to go ahead and do it on the second server. Yeah, so the, the question was, you know, what do you do when you have, uh, you know, multiple environments, kind of a, a you know, dev, test, and, and prod, for example, should you have separate masters for each of those instances? Uh, is it all on one? Is there a licensing concern there? Um, it's a great question. Uh, within Puppet, we have the, the concept of environments. So you could say, you know, I have my uh, production uh, environment within Puppet, so the modules within uh, that production environment would be applied to my production nodes and you can call out uh, within what is the, the puppet.com file on your servers, on those individual agents, which environment it belongs to. Um, and so, you know, if, if, you're, if you're classifying servers, you could say, you know, I want to classify everything with NTP, but depending on which environment that server is a part of, it will pull the NTP class from each of those uh, respective um, environment and it's it's like just a, a directory structure. It's basically one environment with, with a, a one instance of a master running with an entire enterprise that within that one instance you have your environment configuration specific to those environments. Exactly. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. Are there any safety checks so you don't have to push on the production? Because I know you can just define where you want it to push, but I can see it gets into your yeah, um, I mean, there's not an, an are you sure you want to do this when it's going to a production environment. Um, I mean, a lot of those uh, a, a lot of those checks should actually be done sort of on on the version control side. So before you would promote the code up from dev to test to QA, you know, uh, it should be you know, a, a pull request that someone reviews before it gets promoted up into production. Should be. Yeah, exactly. It, sh it should be. Uh -huh. well, can you explain more about uh, global pipeline integration schemes? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you explain more about the global pipeline integration schemes, like uh, integration with the build server, uh, Team City or Jenkins? Mm -hmm. What kinds of integrations? Yeah, so the question was, um, can you talk about our integrations uh, with, with like uh, build pipeline servers, so like Jenkins or uh, Team City and things like that. So you can, you can use Puppet to stand up a Jenkins server pretty easily. And Jenkins is nice because you know, the builds themselves are versioned. So if you wanted to point to you know, a, a build that's coming from Jenkins, you can call out, you know, make sure that you know, all of these servers are getting this version of this build. Um, from this particular repo or, or uh, a, a file share somewhere. Uh, but in terms of sort of a, like a built-in integration, I, I can't think of anything like, unless you guys have more to say on that. Uh, it's about like uh, provisioning tests and maps. Let's say if uh, our unit tests and that's what we would like to do our integration tests, I would like to have uh, like environment spawn for us and mm -hmm. the number right? And that would kill them because we execute our tests and we don't need those environments. Mm -hmm. So it's not like about provisioning or configuring the real service, right. but to drive the provisioning from the real service. Right. Eric, can you there's, speak to that? There's certainly been a, a, a lot of uh, of awesome work that's gone into people that are integrating, like using Jenkins to drive those kinds of integrations, and like they will, you know, we'll, we'll do kind of the R10K code promotion workflow. But in each of those steps, they use the the the, the revision control repository is actually linked into Jenkins that can start up new VMs and and pull them down once once they're done. So each of those block, each of the, the gates to get out towards production is actually 
ha has that sort of stuff. That's a pretty, it's not part of the product. There's certainly some people that are doing integrations like that, but uh, um, yeah, uh, let me dig uh, Let me dig up that there was a really awesome talk that I saw in Amsterdam earlier this year, and I'll pull that up and, and uh, you, can, you can check it out. The, Maybe if you expose this way, yes, maybe those could be called from uh, good servers. Probably you have risk for a cast to drivers. Yeah. question was can you use a fact like embed a fact into a, a resource definition Do you have uh, you know the ability to handle Kickstart files or or um, or any kind of conversions in anything that people with people uh, tackle that task? Yeah. So so with, within Razor, actually the there there's a number of, of sort of layered steps. Here I should have shown this. Um, there's a pretty good overview of, of how Razor works on on the website, and uh, there's sort of this this list of steps it goes through. So you point to a repository to get the ISO. Then you can use, uh, the next step is, is to go through a, a list of tasks. So in installation scripts such as kickstart files, um, so that if you've already done that, you don't have to sort of just throw it away and, and come up with a new way of doing it. And then it'll install the Puppet agent on the system. Um, so yes. Do we have time for another? Yeah. yeah. So for example, Apache. Yeah, so the, 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 the question was, um, you know, you can use a module to install Apache on a system, but what if you have your own version of Apache or your own, like, custom application, for example? Uh, you can point to like the, the repo provider of where, where that's going to live. So go look for this version in this repo somewhere else. So it doesn't have to just be, you know, pulling it down from Yum or something like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'll be, I'll be here.